Welcome to Cornell Keynotes. Agritourism is having a moment, or rather is enjoying a decade of steady growth. The global agritourism market size reached $58 billion in 2022, and the market is expected to reach $114 billion at an annual growth rate of 11% between 2023 and 2028. Statistics aside, it's been invigorating for me to see so many fresh ag-based businesses making bold and imaginative moves in the agritourism space. I have many friends who work on farms and wineries here in New York State, and I'm seeing big changes happen for many of them. That's why I've invited Jen Smith, who leads the Food and Agricultural Startup Programs at Cornell's Center for Regional Economic Advancement, including the Grow New York program, which is an annual $3 million competition for innovative, early-stage, high-growth potential businesses working anywhere in the agri-food system. Jen, great to have you in studio and back on the show. It's nice to be here, Chris. What is agritourism? Agritourism is everything from stopping off at the farm stand and grabbing some sweet corn at, at that time of year through to heavy-duty value-add production going on in things like cheese-making or, or wine-making, through to full hospitality with dining and lodging, through now to kind of next-level entertainments, concerts and other kinds of performances that are occurring on farm. So we've come a long way from pumpkin patches and corn mazes, haven't we? That's right. We are here at Cornell University, which is situated in the heart of the Finger Lakes in New York State. We're surrounded by beautiful farms, cideries, vineyards, dairies. It goes on for hundreds of miles here. New York has a long and storied history of farming and agritourism, as it, I mentioned, is booming all around us. What types of operations are enjoying the most success where we live here, Jen? Well, here in the Finger Lakes in upstate New York, I want to take a moment to say it's up to the operator to define their success. And so when people engage in agritourism as a way to generate increased revenue on the farm, it may not be in the interest of constantly scaling and expanding your footprint. So we see a lot of folks that are adding agritourism to their farms in a relatively modest way and having great success with it. I'm thinking about an operation like Black Diamond Farm here. Uh, they're over outside of Trumansburg. It's an apple farm. It's an extraordinary farm that has a really remarkable diversity of different kinds of apples. They have a, a modest, they call it the cider shack. It's a little more polished than all that, but it's very elbows on the table. It can fit about five, six people max, and they love it. And it's bringing new people in, and it gives the owner, cider maker, a chance to engage with consumers. At the other end of the spectrum, we've got really large producers of craft beverage that are seeing success in adding new jobs and expanding out their offerings and bringing hundreds of thousands of people to the farm each season. So it, it really it depends on what the farmer wants the agritourism experience to be. That's part of the definition of success. New York State is unique, but we're not alone, right? But in New York, the state delivers significant funding and has done a lot to incentivize people in this burgeoning industry. What are some of the factors that contributed to the rise of agritourism in New York State? Sure. From my point of view, it really got a push in 2014 when then-Governor Cuomo signed the Craft Act. That facilitated farmers getting into craft beverage production with a lot fewer barriers. It was scaled down. It made it easier, less expensive to produce alcohol on farms and to sell it directly to consumers. So they didn't, you know, a, a farm winery doesn't have to participate in the three-tier alcohol system. They can, but they can also just sell direct to farms, sell to other farms, sell to other designated areas. That was a big part of it. There was a lot of funding put towards helping farmers stand up these craft beverage businesses and opening hospitality venues so that they could connect with consumers and educate consumers about the place and the product. And those two things are in agritourism really inexorably linked in a really beautiful way, right? That it's a way of showing that this is what we do here and this is the result of it. In addition to that kind of push that New York State put behind agritourism, both in legislation and in funding, I think that during the pandemic, people were interested in exploring destinations that they could get to by car, destinations that let them enjoy an experience outdoors, 
and destinations that gave them a sense that they were participating in the development of a stronger local food system, right? The pandemic's shown such a, a light on all of the cracks that are in our centralized and industrial food system. So it's a way to have a firsthand experience that that gives a sense of uh I'm participating in something that is regional. I think all those factors together have really led to a, a tremendous spike in interesting offerings here in the region and nationally. And consumer tastes, it appears as if there was pent up demand all along for this kind of thing, right? Yeah, I, I, I think that's right. I think that there is a quest for authenticity, authentic experiences. And yeah, it's it's really great to be able to drive two, three hours and indulge that kind of impulse, right, to have an authentic experience and understand where something is made, why it's made the way it is, and enjoy it in place. For our listeners who work in agriculture, who can imagine themselves breaking into this market, maybe having some designs on opening their own business. What are some of the key considerations or cautionary tips that you can provide, Jen? I know you work in a consultatory role at the Center for Regional Economic Advancement. So what are some of the big picture first issues that you want to make sure you have sorted out before you take on this endeavor? Sure. So customer discovery is key and delivering an excellent customer experience is a precondition for any business to succeed. Agritourism is no different. So What is the product or service that you're going to offer? How do you know that consumers want to buy, enjoy, experience it? Making sure you understand that and are building your business model around those fundamental questions, the answers that you're finding to those questions is key. And in that sense, there are additional challenges to to running agritourism, but it is really fundamental entrepreneurship, right? Like how, what, you know, some some financial literacy around how to balance growth and sustainability are going to be an important part to adding on to your business. And thinking about our listeners who may be elsewhere nationally or internationally, you had told me in our prior conversation that there are resources. There sure are. Yeah, I think that a, an amazing resource that's out there is put out by the state of Oregon. They have a whole website dedicated to supporting farms and food producers who are interested in creating agritourism experiences. And that's, you know, certainly got an eye towards the unique regulations and potentials in Oregon, but a lot of it is transferable. And then at the more one-on-one level, I mean, here in New York, there are extension educators in every county. I think that's true throughout many states. Getting in touch with the organizations that offer technical assistance to farms and food producers. They exist in all 50 states, and um, they're coming together under the Regional Food Business Center program that the USDA is funding. So I, I think doing a little bit of investigation in your backyard around who's supporting farms and food producers with capacity building funds and technical assistance. Agritourism is not just farming. There's a high touch hospitality and service aspect to this that it's absolutely critical in order to succeed. Is this the greatest business challenge for farmers? Like what you're saying, not everybody's great at everything, but agritourism, you're taking on a lot. You're doing several different types of businesses at once. Yeah, and, um, you know, I have already mentioned that delivering excellent customer experiences is a key. Part of that is setting customer expectations, letting them know what kind of experience they're going to have. Is it casual? Is it formal? Is it roll up whenever? Is it make an appointment? You know, being really clear with people around when they are welcome to come and visit you because it's not going to be all the time, right? You're, if you're, especially if you're running a farm, there's going to be a restriction on when you can be hosting people, but you want to put them at ease. So be very clear about what you're offering, when you're offering it, and what people need to do to participate in it. Given the severity of this undertaking, there are a million concerns. One of the key challenges uh, or points of focus that should be top of mind for agritourism entrepreneurs is the safety of customers, of staff, and all the liability that spins off from opening your doors and welcoming the public into your place of business. 
I know several farmers who will not engage in agritourism because they feel it trivializes farming, because they feel it puts their businesses and their staffs at risk. There's a lot of heavy duty equipment that's in use. There is a lot of fragility in the farming environment. And so you got to prepare pretty carefully to make sure that if you are bringing people on farm, you're not putting them or your business or your people at risk. Customer education is a big factor, and it's directly related to this hospitality component. You had mentioned that it involves an element of storytelling, uh, having thoughtful signage, next level, you know, kind of programming and all that. Can you talk about the educational component? Because I think it's key to this whole thing. Sure. So, you know, educational can be guided tours. It can be signs that are way posting and teaching people along the way, interpretive, interactive materials. It can be formal classroom experiences. You might have some kind of pavilion set up where there's a classroom environment and you're walking people through information. Or it can be part of a, a dining or a drinking experience that you're helping people through. I'm thinking here of um, Blue Hill at Stone Barns. Mm -hmm. Stone Barns is a farm um, in Patantico in the Hudson Valley. They have a very celebrated restaurant there that at this point is has really developed a next level approach towards educating the people that are dining there, really helping them understand place and production as part of the enjoyment of a meal and doing a tremendous amount of visual and oral and other sensorial storytelling to help people connect to the idea that farming is something that that is risky. It requires commitment. It takes years to accomplish. And so the item that is has been expertly prepared and is in front of you on your plate has a history that goes back years, if not generations, to get there when we're thinking about things like plant breeding and, and um, you know, animal husbandry, that, that there can be generations of work to get the product exactly right on your plate. And so, you know, feeding people the product is a great way to educate them. One of the trends that we've seen here in recent years is the diversification of offerings for the customer on premise, right? We're thinking about some of these places that are trying to be the whole package, right? Spa services, lodging, accommodations, yeah. all meals. Not only do we do wine, but we do beer. And there's a concert tonight. You know what I mean? Not everybody can do this, right? This is a tremendous uh, economic endeavor. Uh, so, you know, just for clarity, we have the Blue Stone model. And then we have all the way down to the corn maze and pumpkin patch type thing. The right? corn maze, the pumpkin patch, the tool shed that, you know, you have a, a college dorm room fridge in that's where you keep your bottles cold. And when somebody says, can I do a tasting, you, you know, with a pull, then we're not kidding. Right? Yeah, that, right. that counts. That's a licensed premise. You know, yeah. that, that, that counts, too. Yeah. Cideries are big here in New York. We're famous for our apples. We always have been. You were with the New York uh, Cider Association. You're very close to the cider and distilled spirits industry. One thing that I think is interesting about your involvement there is that, you know, this is essentially a regional endeavor, right? The associations like this. Uh, can you talk about the synergy among member farms and companies and how that kind of plays out and the advantage of being part of something bigger than just your own agritourism operation? Sure. I mean, most of us are lucky if we do one thing well. Yeah. And then in the case of uh, an apple grower who's also making a great uh, cider, they're already doing two things well. Um, then promoting it and developing a, a category around it and attracting attention, that can be a real challenge. Mm -hmm. So my initial role um, with the Cider Association was to kind of lead efforts around marketing and education. So you have these individual apple growers, cider makers, and they are now working collectively for about a decade in the interest of promoting cider through things like Cider Week and holding educational events for members of the trade, right? The kind of original influencers for us were people who are making the choices around what you're drinking in restaurants and bars or what you're able to buy in a wine or spirits store. So getting all of those people to come down and taste through what is on offer in New York, right? 
not any one producer, but a whole lot of producers and giving them a footprint down in New York City. In recent years, and quite recently, in the Finger Lakes here, we've developed a Finger Lakes cider trail. So the group of about a dozen cideries that are all growing their own apples and making cider from them are working together to help get the person who stumbles upon their tasting room to drive down the road and go to the next cidery and try it there. A little cross-pollinization, a little rising tide for everyone. Also, a way to help educate people about not only what is common amongst the quality and excellence of Finger Lake Cider Makers and a sense of place and flavor of the region, but also what is unique between the different cider makers, that, that side by side. So things like passports and trails and maps and collectives are, are a really effective way to create a sense of awareness of place and regionality and also increase and amplify the voice of any one cider maker by promoting the collective. Jen, we kicked off with some encouraging and, frankly, eye-popping statistics on growth in agritourism. Uh, where do you see things trending uh, within the industry? Two main trends. I think that we're going to see an increase in agritourism experiences that are built around self-care and wellness. And I think that if you look at something like Woofing working on organic farms as a kind of couple of weeks, uh, month-long sojourn, I think that kind of experiential um, contributory tourism has a lot of promise for the ag industry, uh, meeting a consumer interest in sustainable and regenerative tourism. How about, uh, is there room to grow, right? So much room to go. I, I don't think we've tapped out at all, um, either in, in the interest in the agritourism that we have now or this kind of next level kind of hospitality experiences that we seem to be trending towards. Super exciting time in agritourism. Jen Smith, thanks for coming by. My pleasure. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss new episodes as they are released wherever you listen to podcasts. To learn more about entrepreneurship, food product development, hospitality, or sustainable tourism, check out the episode notes for more information on eCornell online certificate programs and courses. Thank you for listening.